Welcome everyone to Facebook Live here from Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin Sneeder, the global managing partner of McKinsey & Company. First of all, Kevin, welcome to Davos. Thank Staying you. warm somehow? Trying to. Yeah. I'm Scottish, it's not that cold. <laughs> no, no. This is warm, this is great. <laughs> well, congratulations on becoming the global managing partner of McKinsey. It's very exciting. And uh, of course, one of the most talked about things in the last six months that relates to your ascent into this position is that bucking convention, yeah. uh, you have decided to remain in Asia, in Hong mm -hmm. Kong, where you had been serving for years. And you're an Asia hand. You've lived in China before. But how has that been, staying in Asia, running McKinsey from Asia? Um, you know, that, that obviously is a demonstration of how important Asia is for McKinsey and globally. So how do you respond to that? Well, I think there's two reasons why I stayed. The first mm -hmm. is exactly what you said, a demonstration that Asia really matters. Mm -hmm. I believe that passionately. I've lived and worked in and out of Asia since 1995 when I first moved to Hong Kong and then north mm -hmm. to Beijing. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt that it's really important we understand what's happening in the region yeah. and that we're part of the region. And so for me, it was a very clear signal that it's also an important part of the firm more generally. So mm -hmm. I was keen to be based there. I have to be honest, there's also a personal reason. Sure. I'm part of a dual career family. My wife has a job in Hong Kong that she loves mm -hmm. and enjoys. And my daughters both were at school in Hong right. Kong. One of them's just gone to college in the US. The other one is still very much with us in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. And we and felt from a family we should stay. And then there are many other reasons. Yeah. It's a great city. There's lots going on there. We stayed. Yeah. So Asia is very vast. No two people have the same understanding even of the geography of Asia. For me, it literally stretches from the Persian Gulf to Russia to Australia to Japan. You're at the heart of it. But how do you prioritize among this vastly diverse landscape of Asia with, uh, quite frankly, obviously, differential growth prospects? It's true that Asia is a land of many contrasts, of course. I mean, there's at one level no such thing since it's so geographically broad. And for us, it starts in Australia and it goes all the way up to India and beyond. Mm. But on the other hand, it is quite interconnected and frankly, even more so these days. And so rather than thinking about prioritizing, I think the task mm -hmm. is to understand what is going on across the region. Mm -hmm. For the world, the flows of goods and services within Asia is hugely important. Right. And so I've always taken a view that, yes, it's vital to understand China, but you know what? It's pretty important to understand Indonesia. Right. Australia is a very important market in terms of what goes on there. So I've tried to take a view of being out in the region, get to all the parts of the region, mm -hmm. and really make sure that it's not just me, but others are taking the time to understand what's happening. Right. So there has been a very China-centric view of Asia now, yeah. but you truly appreciate there are these other very significant growth markets. They're not just up and coming. They've arrived in many ways. If you look at India and its growth rates being even faster than China, for example. And actually, all of these countries benefiting from the internal integration. They tend to be viewed as individual right. and how they relate to the US or to Europe, but their trade with each other is greater than their trade with the rest of the world. So when you look at these intra-Asian flows, who, who's benefiting the most? Well, first and foremost, intra-Asian trade could be even greater, and I will be, inter right. will be greater. What we're seeing, frankly, due to some of the tensions that are taking place elsewhere, mm -hmm. is a redirection of trade within Asia. So mm -hmm. let's not forget it's actually still early days. Right. Intra-Asian trade is for all that you said, lower than trade within the European Union amongst mm -hmm. the European Union's members. Mm -hmm. So I firmly believe this is only going to increase. Mm -hmm. That said, it's also the case that there are still quite a few barriers. Right. And so working on eliminating those barriers becomes important too. But if you take India, exactly as you said, any conversation about growth in the world, it's been a huge mistake to forget about the Indian economy. From a demographic point of view, it's going to be far more important right. to the world than any other economy exactly. in terms of the growth in the population and more importantly, the growth in the working age population. Right. Exactly. A million new workers every month. Mm -hmm. Think of that number. And remember, in other parts of Asia, like Japan, a very significant contraction in the workforce, down 20%, some people think, over the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. And China's already seen its workforce plateau, That's and it right. too will start to decline. Mm -hmm. So a conversation about Asia is complete, is inadequate if it doesn't include a real understanding of what's happening in India. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It's pretty important to understand Vietnam, right. an exporter without rival, you could argue, mm -hmm. very dependent on maintaining global trade, mm -hmm. very dependent on that, but at the same time, setting a bar in terms of can it make the transition from a labor arbitrage economy right. to one that's more value added in mm -hmm. terms of knowledge. It in many ways embodies a challenge the whole world faces. So the differences within Asia, between Asian countries are in their size, in their GDP, in their wealth, also though their sort of regulatory landscape, right? I mean, the reform capacity and the momentum around reform. And you obviously see that, that, diver that diversity. 
McKinsey, obviously very unique in operating, you know, very strongly across public and private sectors. You're an agent of reform. You know, you help improve corporate governance, state capacity. So where are you seeing the countries, not only that are, you know, performing hypersonically well because of being in the demographic sweet spot, but we are also seeing the political will in the corporate sector and the governments to do the kinds of reforms well, that are the necessary. reality is they all have very different starting points. Yeah. And context matters in Asia. It's very easy to parachute in and Absolutely. offer words of wisdom, but if you don't understand the starting points, yeah. those words of wisdom are very dangerously true. theoretical. I think the answer to your question is really one more of appreciating, for example, what's going on in Indonesia. Yeah. Indonesia is a vitally important economy, if you think of it, the size and the population. And if you look at the path that country's now on, you get encouraged to believe that there is a conviction around building out the infrastructure, sure. creating the environment in which the consumer economy can start to thrive. Mm -hmm. If you go to Vietnam, big changes in FDI restrictions a couple of years ago have triggered a wave of investment and a sense of optimism around how that economy will build its capacity to be a source of manufacturing, mm -hmm. not just on a low cost basis, but on a value added basis. Mm -hmm. Big regulatory reform triggered that. Mm -hmm. I could go on. I think if you ask yourself about the nature of the way in which India is changing in terms of its I think commitment to make an India on the one hand, but also a sense that it is opening up sectors to investment from overseas. You have to understand the right. way in which that's going to shape the global economy. Mm -hmm. So the regulatory situation, rather than offer a sweeping statement, these are the three countries that make a difference, I would simply say this, which is you have to understand the way in which regulation is changing and then what that says about the role those countries are going to play in the global economy. Absolutely. So Indonesia has a pavilion here on the promenade. They do just down there. Four or five Indian yeah. states do, I whose names too. most people can't pronounce. But there is a very <laughs> robust Asian presence here. However, inside the Congress Center, the mood does not reflect this Asian optimism. Yep. And you're inside there, you're talking to political leaders, business leaders. What are you hearing and what are you telling them from your very unique vantage point in yeah, Asia? Prague, you're right. It is um, quite striking. Because you come from Asia where I think there remains a general level of confidence, notwithstanding an admitted slowdown, as Wang Shishan said, in the Chinese economy, but one he characterized as being relatively modest. Mm -hmm. And I think in Asia, that's the general sense, though, of course, there has been a slowdown and softening. But you come here, and I, my characterization is a lot of caution, mm -hmm. trending gloomy. You know, right. there is just this sense of unease. I ask a lot of CEOs when I meet them, and I've had the chance to meet a lot in the last couple of days, how's business? And what they all reply is, my business is great, but I'm worried about everybody else's business. <laughs> and you know, just that comment talks to the sort of sense of concern, concern mm -hmm. around global tensions, concern around the transition in technology and what that means for their businesses, concern around how are commodity prices moving, what's right. going to happen to oil? So lots of reasons why people are Moving from this time last year in Davos, when I think people were generally seeing some of those issues, but putting them behind them and remaining confident and optimistic, to a general sense of caution and, as I say, trending gloomy. Mm -hmm. And that is a shift, and you feel it. And that, but that's very internal. It seems to be a Western conversation. What, right. what about the Asian ideas, you know, and the Asian promise? Well, that's the contrast. Yeah. That is the contrast. I've been to plenty of the Asian sessions, and rightly, as you said, mm -hmm many countries are well represented here and you go to those and you think you're having a different Davos exactly, yeah. because within those rooms it's still a conversation around what are we doing to drive development is our embrace of technology fast enough to ensure we're not just competing mm -hmm. in labor how do we think about what we're doing on the educational reforms that are happening in many Asian countries but it's all couched in a positive sense right. and frankly the phrase that comes to my mind is tomorrow will be better than today right. That conviction, tomorrow mm -hmm. will be better than today, is uniformly felt. Yeah. Even though it might be a little less better than we thought, but it's still going to be better. Right. The optimism. Optimism is not a word I would use to characterize <laughs> right. some of the other sessions I've yeah. been in. Yeah. So now you're about six months into your yeah. tenure as a global managing partner. What are the key things you've learned in the last uh, six months? Gosh. Um, well, the first thing I learned is nothing prepares you for the role. Right. You think you know what you're getting into, but mm -hmm. actually you don't. And what I've learned in the first six months is the world is a really big place. I've had the chance to really get around mm -hmm. because I've been based in Asia. I was based in the US for 10 years. I was based in Europe for many years. But I never, for example, spent much time in Latin America. Right. There's a lot going on in Latin America. In fact, Latin America is one of the countries that really is occupying mm -hmm. a lot of mind share here. But as I've traveled there and really trying to understand what's happening in Brazil, for example, or what's happening in Colombia and some of the other economies, that's been an important lesson. Mm -hmm. So a big part of what I've learned is what's happening further afield. Yeah. 
The other thing I've learned is that business leaders get up every morning, they think they know what they're going to do, but actually the day can just unfold in wholly different ways. And I've learned that. Other than calling you, they're not sure well, what else they're going to do. <laughs> that, that's a nice thought. <laughs> but I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing either. And you know, you get the unexpected. Yeah. I've had to deal with some media stuff. There's lots of things yeah. nobody prepares you for. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to ask yourself, not if people think that you've done something wrong, it's more what are you going to do? How do you right. act? How do you ensure that you learn? And so that's been a right. big part of what I've been doing. It's fitting that you've been globe prodding so much since McKinsey is such a global company, but it's also become a real agent of digital transformation. It's a big Absolutely. theme. You know, your reports are very successfully quantifying in a way how digitization is playing out, the value of the services economy to the world and so forth. It's a real thought leadership value added. How much is that part of your strategy for the firm for the next generation, for the next years that, uh, that you'll be in charge? Well, let's be clear. My strategy for the firm ensures that technology is high up in that agenda. Right. Right. It's not just my strategy. That's what we, I think, very much believe. We believe we have to make sure that we and our clients are prepared for the many ways in which technology is reshaping our businesses. And there's so many forms of that. The digital, quote, revolution well underway, of course, embraced by many, but not by all the embrace of data and analytics to really make sure we understand new ways to make decisions. We're investing a lot in that. We have 6,000 technologists wow. dedicated to making sure we're in a better place to understand what's going on. 2,000 translators, 4,000 core IT. That's a big shift. And at the same time, frankly, thinking through the organizational aspects of all of this, because mm -hmm. you can embrace the technology, but then the organizational shift is enormous. Mm -hmm. You wrap all that up, Actually, we're doing a lot of work in strategy, our heritage, because in this world where technology is reshaping organizations, the choices you make around portfolios, where you compete, how you compete, the classic strategy choices have also come back onto the, the agenda. So we're spending a lot of time on those issues. Mm -hmm. My strategy is a simple one. It's the partnership decides what it wants to do. But if I can nudge it in the direction of a real investment in technology, a real focus on what that means for the world and for us and our clients, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So that's very high up on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So clearly you fit this pattern of global strategic thinking that McKinsey is uh, characterized for, but you are doing it in this unorthodox way, if you will, but that'll become the new norm uh, I to do so do the same. Out, of, yeah. uh, out of Asia. So on behalf of the five billion Asians, <laughs> uh, we want to show our gratitude for your decision to base uh, yourself to stay in Asia and I present you the Futures Asian Award. Oh, thank uh, this you. is actually my new book. You're the oh, first to receive it. Thank you. So thank you very I'm, much. I'm touched. Uh, <laughs> I'm touched. Do I get to cry? Or what no, no, you don't have you to. You don't have here. to. <laughs> Mom, look at this. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us here on Facebook Live from the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's been a pleasure uh, having you join our conversation. And uh, we look forward to the next one. Kevin, congratulations again. Thanks, Great Brad. to chat with you. Great being with thank you. you. Thanks a lot.